good night and good morning to everyone. This is update for May 13, 2022, day 79 of the war, end of the date update. As always, we're going to do a strategic update and then we're going to switch to walk through the front lines. First, let's do strategic update and we have two major topics. One is Finland again and then the second one is uh, Ukrainian economy. So let's start with Finland. Uh, as uh, we mentioned yesterday, uh, Russia was threatening to Finland and it was pretty quick with actual actions uh, towards Finland. So as of, tomorrow, uh, as of uh, I guess, uh, this night, uh, they are stopping supply of electricity to Finland and also potentially stopping supply of natural gas. Uh, just for the reference, um, Finland consumes about 80 terawatt hours of electricity and the Russia supplied 16, which means it's 20%. In addition, the natural gas is about 6% in sort of, you know, ener in, in energy generation uh, in Finland inside. So if you kind of try to put everything together, that's potential loss of about 26% of electricity right or of energy supply in the country that that's pretty significant and we hope that uh, Swid uh, that Finland can get uh, electricity from uh, Sweden if it has excess capacity but something tells us that they probably don't given that Finland was buying from Russia and also it's buying some from Estonia uh, for terawatt hour, so that could be also under threat, um, giving the whole actions of Russia. So as you can see, that's pretty drastic development there that potentially threaten significant drop in GDP in Finland if it doesn't find quick replacement for this for this uh, for this amount of energy that it, that it lost. Um, now switching uh, back to uh, to Ukrainian economy, it's in a total free fall, total disaster. So government collect in April, government collected sixty percent of revenues relative to what normally they would collect, and that reflects your GDP, right? So you have so that's this really assumes that the drop of GDP is about forty percent. We can sort of ballpark it, right? And then they project that in May they're gonna collect 45 to 50 percent of, of of the tax revenues, uh, and we do think that it's probably gonna be closer to 45, even 40 percent, because there is a huge, huge, huge problem with fuel in country. Essentially, there's almost no fuel for civilians. No, meaning by fuel we mean uh, gasoline and diesel fuel for uh, for trucks, for cars. So essentially everything is paralyzed except for military. And as we mentioned before, this problem is, is obviously Russia contributed to it or initially caused it, but then it was significantly magnified by totally disastrous action of the Ukrainian government who decided to implement price controls in the country. And always, and as we always know, price control lead to shortages because nobody's going to sell at the loss. So as a result, that's what's going on. And then, as we mentioned before as well, that they don't even realize that this is wrong and they just kind of continue with this policy. So the situation is worsening uh, in Ukraine. So we think probably in June, July, the state revenues will dwindle to probably 10, 20, 15 percent and essentially it's going to be nothing. And it will be totally, totally dependent on financial, on foreign financial aid. The run rate for Ukrainian budget is about $5 billion per month. Uh, at this point, uh, Ukraine got pledge of $30 billion from, I believe, G7, and then potentially $40 billion from the U.S., but that was blocked, as we all know, in a Senate in the US. So that's about enough for 14 months to survive 14 months, next 14 months, and well, actually, you know, probably a little bit more, given that the revenue is not dropping to zero right now. But that's uh, 
you know, very difficult uh, disaster situation in Ukrainian economy. Essentially, it's going to be non-existent existent, uh, in probably by end of July. And we want to stress that obviously war is a big reason for that, but incompetent and inept actions of Ukrainian government hugely, hugely worsen the problem and magnify it. So that's that's very important to understand situation there. And they don't even try to solve it with by removing all kind of bureaucratic obstacles that create huge incentives for corruption in the country. And that's that's a root cause. And, and that's very, it will be um, very problematic because this war is turning into war of attrition. In addition, we would like to, uh, for those who are interested, people were asking about like where's what's going on with Ukrainian army size-wise and everything. So now we have a little bit more official numbers. So right now, Ukrainian army is um, on. They have five hundred thousand, sort of call it service uh, service people or you know soldiers, whatever you call it. We're not sure what's a proper what, proper term to describe that. And out of that, we all know that, oh, and then there is a plan to raise it in the next uh, couple of months as to uh, 1 million. So what is going on, you know, when we anticipate the question, so, okay, there are 200,000 that sort of on the front line. So what's going on with this 300,000 and then potentially another 500,000? So what's the problem with all of those people that there is not enough uh, weapons, and ammunition. So the hope, I guess, is that Ukraine will receive enough weapons through this land lease program that was passed a couple of weeks ago, and that will allow Ukraine to have, you know, army up to one million, right? Mm, and so, so this is really kind of answers the question where what the pass for Russia, right? Because with 200,000, and we estimate that it's actually at this point not 200,000, it's definitely less. And this is our just ballpark estimate is that the losses on both sides probably by now between 50 to 60,000. And, and by that, we mean both dead and wounded and prisoners of war, missing all, all, all kind of like total losses, right? So between 50 to 60,000 on both sides, both sides started with about 200,000. So both sides have, let's say, in, from the original army, about 150,000. We estimate that Russia probably refilled about 25,000 out of that missing 50. So roughly, ball, it's all ballparking, right? Very, very kind of like a guessy number. So please don't think, you know, please don't ask us, oh, please show us exact you know, where the source coming, it's more on the, based on what we see in terms of the uh, wounded, dead and all that stuff, but it's more anecdotal, right? So based on, on anecdotal um, uh, ex, uh, sort of information and then trying to, you know, extrapolate it and kind of based on that. So that's not terribly reliable number, but directionally it's probably right. So, and then Ukraine probably was able to fill all 50 because, you know, there is 300,000, so you have plenty to refill the losses, right? So, actually, it does look like at this point that the Ukrainian army on the battlefield is slightly outnumbering um, Russian army. Not by much, but uh, they, pro they, they, uh, they have worse training overall and... and less equipment, less weapons and, and, and shortage of ammunition. So, but the quantity simple, if you just compare just on, on the quantity, probably there's a little bit, Ukrainian army is a little bit large at this point. So that's the situation uh, with Ukrainian army and what's going on there. And then going back to what this leaves Russia with, Russia has at this point, um, essentially two options, either do mobilization because Obviously, if you, you if you're gonna face, let's say, army of you know, if not one million, then let's say nine hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand people, you know, hundred seventy five is obviously not enough. And so there are two options: mobilization or using unconventional 
weapons, which means some nuclear and things like that. And maybe then actively destroying bridges across Dnipro River, as we discussed before, that they started doing that, but then they kind of, Russian side sort of stopped uh, at that. So, uh, the, and then there another difficult situation, well, not difficult, but situation that doesn't lead to, um, uh, how to say, negotiations is Ukraine, Ukraine is clearly stating that it wants all of its territories back meaning including Crimea, right? Then Russia is clearly stating that they're not going to return Crimea for sure. Um, and so that does not give any room for negotiations. And so the, the whole thing is going to get going to get decided on the battlefield. So that really means that this conflict is probably going to um, intensify we you know we cannot say when exactly it's hard it's obviously hard to predict but it does look at this point overall that Russian army is clearly lose, lost its momentum and about to totally stop and kind of be on defensive and at that point it will be probably very untenable inside of Russia to to allow that to happen because propaganda needs to show sort of progress, victories, and then there is nothing at all, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot sort of work with that. So um, something is going to happen and probably relatively soon. Okay, so now after all of this strategic discussion, let's, uh, let's do a frontline work through. Uh, as always, we're going to do it in a, f a clockwise fashion. We're going to start with Kharkiv, which is here. So let's uh, and one uh, another mm, in, well relatively important uh, note is that the for, looks like 14th brigade that used to be here uh, against the Herson bridgehead it was moved now to uh, to Izum bridgehead so but we'll see it once we get there so <clears throat> let's look at what's going on here northeast of Kharkiv as you can see Ukrainian side managed to. Uh, to take to take control of the state border in this area, and so there is relatively small buffer left here, and we're pretty sure that Ukrainian side will continue putting pressure to squeeze out Russian screening troops be, uh, back to the Russian territory. <clears throat> so now let's uh, let's let's actually look what's going on here at the Zoom bridgehead. There are small developments, small progress there, and just overall situation, and see why, what's why the what is Fortinis Brigade is doing there. So this is really big picture of it, right? So this is at birds sort of uh, birds view. So we just put uh, and because it's you know there are so many units on the Russian side, we couldn't fit them, and probably some of them are not even at this point on the bridgehead itself. So this is. Uh, our best estimate of how they are so in our view those these four brigades are relatively fresh so that's probably the uh, f like workhorse and fighting power and these units here have been there some of them from the very beginning like for example uh, six tank brigade from the 14th 47th tank division probably uh, suffered enough losses to be not to be capable of uh, active offensive actions uh, and the same probably is more or less uh, true about the third uh, mechanized division and fourth tank division. And then there was a rag tag team of th uh, three units that suffered losses before in Kiev West from the airborne division. Uh, so from two airborne divisions, 76 airborne division and 100, uh, 106 airborne division. And in sort of Russian and Ukrainian term, it literally translates as consolidated unit, which means like you just get, you you basically, you know, you you kind of like reduce the battle worn unit to the to the unit that can actually continue fighting, and it's like you know like people from all kind of companies, everything is mixed up, right? It's just like just one uh, like big kind of like. Not big unit, but it just basically 
there is no more like boundaries in terms of battalions and, and everything. Everybody's kind of like in one group, basically. Uh, and then uh, 144th Division is another um, unit that was ha- with heavy casualties that was sort of donating some of it, you know, some of it, uh, some of its support here as well. So uh, on the Ukrainian side, from the beginning, there was uh, 81st Brigade and then 95th Brigade joined and 25th Brigade joined. And then latest, latest com- late comer was 90, 93rd. And then recently 14th Brigade came here. And this was related to that sort of, of uh, counter-offensive or whatever you call it, Ukrainian attempt to basically... Um, destroy uh, Izum bridgehead by actually attacking and uh, attacking between these two rivers and creating threat to cut off uh, Russian troops and force their withdrawal. As you can now even see from this just graphical presentation, it's totally mission impossible because you, you see the number, even they this one's a bell worn, uh, th- there's there's still enough power to successfully um, conduct defensive operations here, and this is just one brigade. So uh, it, there's no way in this pla- on this planet that they can do anything here successfully. Um, so, but uh, th- this unit was brought here uh, with probably goal to do some kind of offensive, and it looks to us that this is all falling apart at this point. So uh, that's the situation here. This is 79th Brigade defending Le Mans Bridgehead. Now let's actually look a little bit, have a little bit more closer look at this Izum Bridgehead here. So uh, there was one development here. So Russian side kind of squeezed out Ukrainian troops from the village of Dovhenke. So, and it was kind of like, you see like, it was kind of salient here, Ukrainians, you know, salient and they, uh, shelled extremely heavily with artillery and then they managed it apparently was strong enough that Ukrainian troops mostly withdrew uh, towards south and then you know Russian side captured this village is effectively so so at this point this village is in Russian control uh, per our information um, so that was a small progress that Russian troops managed to achieve um, on the Zoom Bridgehead today. On Liman Bridgehead, it's all the same, no news here. Everything is more or less stable. Uh, intense fighting, but there are no changes here. Now let's continue. Let's look at their another place that was that was um, gaining attention and uh, it's a tip of the Donbass salient, which is this one. And we, we call it uh, Severodonetsk salient, where the Russian side is trying to achieve encirclement of Ukrainian troops here. So basically, it's a it's a it's attempt to do smaller version of of this Donbass salient. Um, and that attempt seems to be fizzling out as well. So probably most people have seen a uh, huge destruction of Russian equipment and probably troops here near Bilohorivka. Russian side lost close to 100 uh, unit pieces of equipment here. Uh, and so the bridgehead was destroyed. So that really means that that also, you know, drains the power of this attacking units quite, it's a significant blow. So the, the ability to continue attacks is probably, has probably diminished significantly. They probably still will try to continue that, but we think it's going to last probably another three, four, five, six, at most a week, unless they receive a uh, you know reinforcement and things change completely and stuff like that. But given the current amount of troops, there is not much sort of fuel left here on this side for for the Russian on on the Russian side. And as you can see, we're also learning as we mentioned before we suspected that they attacking trying to um, establish bridgehead here near the village of Dronimka so we got confirmation so basically Russian side was was launching multiple attacks in in attempt to figure out where there is a weak spot and then obviously develop that 
the exploit that weakness and go from there. So initially they were successful here in Belohorivka. However, as we mentioned before, Ukrainian side brought in as reinforcement 58th Brigade and 17th Tank Brigade was operating here already. So the together they managed to destroy this uh, this bridgehead here. So for now, situation here we believe is stable and there is it's obviously there is a threat, but um, but the chances of success for Russian attempt to encircle Ukrainian troops here in this Severodonetsk salient are dwindling tremendously, in our opinion. Um, let's uh, then look what's going on here uh, in Severodonetsk. Uh, Russian side continues to put pressure on Ukrainian troops. So there are some fighting on outskirts, but nothing really major to report here in terms of major changes. If we go look a little south, again, Russian attacks on Toshkivka that don't yield any results. The same is happening here in Arikhova. Uh, there's uh, fighting in the village and neither side fully controls it. So it's just ongoing fighting and it's been going on here probably at this point for at least two weeks. Uh, then and let's move a little bit south and look here around Popasna. So a uh, Russian side managed to um, made a, uh, quite a bit of progress yesterday. That was dangerous. Uh, at this point, the situation was stabilized here. So there was no progress by Russian side uh, in, in, in this northern direction because that would be like a southern pincer, right? That was the most promising opportunity for the Russian side here. And then obviously if they were able to continue from Belogorivka, they probably could sort of create something, you know, this this type of encirclement. But this one is just sort of clean, destroyed, and the most important that the Russian side suffered significant losses, so the opportunity to continue here are quite sort of diminished. And then here we still, you know, we know that there are these three units, but it's there is potentially something more that we're not aware of here. So they manage, and we're also, as we mentioned, we are not clear what was going on with the 24th Brigade like past week. And, well, we do know that they suffered very heavy losses here trying to defend Papasna. And maybe that's the result of that. that the, it started, the, the unit started to kind of um, call it breakdown. And so, but for now, the situation here is stable and we suspect that there are some reinforcements from either 58th Brigade or 17th Brigade here as well. So for now, this this looks stable. The situation is not great for Ukrainian side, but uh, but it, there, the chances of encirclement are significantly lower. Looks like right now. Okay, let's uh, let's. This is the same picture. We're just showing a little bit of this front line to the south of Popasna, just to give you a feel how it looks. So it looks like very kind of like a salient on the Russian side as well, you know, at this point here. And obviously there is significant concentration of Russian troops in Popasna and this kind of this this little sort of salient or whatever you call it, this cone. Um, so let's uh, keep going. Um, this stretch of the front line is not never sort of changing. There is artillery shelling, you know, exchange of fire, but there is there are no active attacks here. Just more like a defensive actions by both sides. So we're gonna look uh, straight west of the Nets. There are some updates there as well. So Russian side managed to ex to move like five. It's five to seven hundred meters forward here towards the village of Nova Bakhmutivka. So literally it's like they control where this arrow now now is. So it's like so this basically this the salient becoming a little bit more pointy, right? So that's kind of almost like perfectly describing what they control at this point. So not much progress, but nevertheless there is some progress there. Um, again, uh, attacks on Avdiivka here, attacks on Marinka as always, attacks on Novo Mikhailovka, but uh, none of them yielded any uh, any progress for the Russian side. There was another area where the Russian side made progress. They captured the village of Pavlivka, which is 
southwest of Wuhledar and was kind of essentially um, sort of uh, buffer or um, you know kind of like m making defenses of uh, making uh, let's say sort of in a way protecting Wuhledar from southwest so it was captured and now the fighting is happening on the outskirts of Wuhledar uh, which is obviously uh, worse uh, you know this this means the situation here is getting worse and there is opportunity for Russian side to kind of create uh, to exploit this this potentially hole here and kind of create the wedge let's actually uh, let's actually look at the Parisia front line in in the eastern section of it and we'll, we'll see there the situation so as you can see now the Ukrainian troops retreated to Vuhletar so in we don't know if there are any Ukrainian troops. That's why there is a question mark. We don't know front line in this area, like exactly. We do know that uh, there are Ukrainian um, troops in uh, Prochistivka and potentially in Zolotaneva, but we don't know uh, how it all goes here in this area. So this essentially this creates opportunity to create kind of you know wedge kind of like this and try to exploit and eventually if this whole area is gonna get cleared out. You you have uh, Velika Novosilka is kind of like semi encircled, right? So it's kind of like in very difficult position here, potentially if things go in 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 bad direction. We're not saying that they they are. It looks very much as a just tactical sort of win for the Russian side, but potentially uh, we're just kind of like extrapolating the situation, literally extrapolating. Uh, which is not always the greatest approach, but we're kind of looking at the worst case scenario, right? So what could happen? And um, this would put Velika Novosilka kind of like in the pins, in sort of like in the, under squeeze and potentially force withdrawal from there towards north, uh, which is obviously would not be great for Ukrainian side. But I think this is so, it's very far, far away from this scenario. And this is just kind of totally worst case scenario, which we don't think is is happening. But that's we need to keep our eye and see what's going on there. So next one, then there is this uh, wedge that was created by the Russian attack. It's stable here, no new developments. Its front, as we discussed many times, is stabilized by 128th Brigade, which was brought in here in Azoki Regiment. So this is more or less stable now. No new changes here in this western section of the Zaporizhia uh, front line. So just we'll just keep going and uh, look at um, Kherson uh, bridgehead here. So as we mentioned, the 14th Brigade was uh, transferred to Izum. And so now <laughs> there is a little bit less of Ukrainian troops. Maybe there's new brigades being formed and brought in, but we're not aware of that. Um, so but situation generally is stable here no major you know attacks except for here there was attack we discussed which was uh ukrainian troops moved a little bit towards south about five to seven kilometers and captured a couple villages but really like it's not it looks to us more just kind of like a tactical attack rather than anything big or you know like you know part of the bigger offense or anything like that uh, and then we're also hearing that there is renewed fighting here in the village of uh, Alexandrovka um, so uh, that's just information that we're learning like literally a couple hours ago uh, it's still unverified so we'll hopefully know tomorrow more what's going on there again Otherwise, this is again stable, both sides, well, especially Russian side here is on defensive and trying to, uh, in, you know, dig, dig in and prepare for defensive uh, actions here. Okay, that's it for, to, uh, for tonight. Uh, thanks again for watching and until tomorrow. Bye-bye.